Hello everyone, my name is David Peabody. I'm a high school math teacher in Seattle, Washington. I'll be presenting a, a talk called Math and Art Technology History at the NCTM annual meeting in San Antonio in 2017. So in case you missed it or would like to see it again, I'm going to run through the slideshow and just give you a, a, a rundown of some of the things that I'd, I'd like to share. First off, what is M-A-T-H? M-A-T-H stands for Math in Art Technology History. About six years ago, my math department in my uh, a public school that I used to work at found that students, after they finished Algebra II, the state requirement, they wanted to take more math, but not particularly the STEM classes, the pre-calc or the AP stats. They found that uh, in it, when they were placed in there, they, they were not successful, didn't like it. And so we wanted to find something else that could serve their needs. And so we decided to, to develop two sister classes, one called Statistics Applications or Stats Apps, and another called MATH, Math and Art Technology History. I volunteered to teach this one, the, the MATH, and so I thought of all the, the fun things I've always wanted to teach but really couldn't just because we are busy with the, the regular learning targets in our math classes. And so uh, that was how M-A-T-H was born. It, I wanted it to be very different than a regular math class because it was, math, it was students who wanted to take math, but, but not the typical uh, class environment. So the first unit I, I did was called Introductory Presentations, where students shared topics in art technology history that interest them. They shared what they wanted to do or be in the future, and they led an activity for the whole class, like a dance move or a language, maybe something with art or something like a, a knot tying that someone would use in, in equestrian events, uh, anything, just to get them up there and to get them thinking about teaching other people. I'm going to run through some of the, the units and some of the resources I used in those units and then some assignments and a lot of student work in these in these slides. First off, I start with numbers and counting, kind of where it all began, the counting systems across cultures. We looked into the history of zero. We discussed what if there were no numbers, and and this this art piece was uh, where a student students had to use all 10 of the Hindu Arabic numerals, and you can see if you look closely, the water, the fish, even the bubbles are numbers. That that book on the, the bottom left is called The History of Counting. It's a, it's a children's book, but it really gives a, a, a great thorough explanation of where it all began and the evolution or the creation of mathematics. I've always wanted to learn how to count on the abacus and use the abacus, so we created the our homemade abacuses. Those are Chinese abacuses, and then the pictures on the right are students that are doing some time practices to demonstrate their skill. It's, a, it's more of a tactile approach, and it's a, a lot of people who were not great uh, adders or subtractors became really skilled because they were, it was more tactile and they, it was a physical skill. Another, some student work here is on the left. There was, uh, students did their own little projects, and I think uh, Jeremy did this lattice method of multiplying where you laid strips across, and that, that is introducing or, or or illustrating 24 times 32 is 768. I, I can't remember how it happens, but you count the number of overlaps or maybe the, the gaps in between. And on the right, uh, Spencer did a uh, studied Sumeria around 3000 BC, and that is supposed to be a, a clay Sumerian man with a tablet and a, a stylus used to create some of the, the, no, the numerals or the symbols that were, I believe, in base 10 and base 60. In Sumeria. We look into architecture. It's a, a new unit for me and so this last semester when I offered it we I had students choose a, a period and they had to make a treehouse out of the in the period or style architectural style that they wanted and then a, find as much of math in it as they could. So this is a, a picture of Lauren's Renaissance treehouse. She focuses on the columns, the arches, uh, the geometry of the dome. And Jordan on the left looked, she wanted to look at the, the history of the arches from the vocabulary, forces, and symmetry. And so her, her treehouse is, 
is standing there on a ledge with different arches, and then she she shows the two centered arch and then the one centered arch. And Katrina wanted to study Egyptian architecture, and she analyzed the Great Pyramid and explored the ratios of height and slope between them. I like this one, uh, this unit a lot just because it had a lot of uh, different student work and uh, it engaged all students. David did not want to, oop, I want to play this. David did not want to do an art piece, so I gave him uh, the opportunity to, to look into Minecraft. It's, it's something that he wanted and he, he chose to do a Roman treehouse out of Minecraft. I'll forward you to about where, there where he's taking you up the treehouse. It he didn't have sound to work, so he put uh, placards along the way to illustrate the the different features that a Roman treehouse would be. And then right about I'll forward maybe to around I think two minutes is when he zooms out and shows you the whole treehouse. From a Roman perspective. Sorry, I don't want to make you too dizzy. Well, I think in a moment he'll zoom out. There it is. It's kind of fun. And it engages all students. A unit of origami is one of my favorites. We look at uh, foldy things, so not just uh, origami with origami paper, but things in real life that fold from DNA to my dog's uh, travel water w water dish. And uh, students were to make a, a technical video of how that worked. They also uh, took the seven standard tangram pieces and they had to make a video of how to fold an origami piece of paper into those seven tangram pieces as efficiently and clearly as possible. One of my, I keep saying this, another favorite is the golden ratio. And I think it is one of the richest treasures of mathematics. It's both human and, mat and natural. Um, and deeply mathematical. We look into pine cones and how the structure of pine cones adheres to Fibonacci sequences as you trace the, the, the number of, of spirals that start from the bottom of the pine cone out in several different ways. The picture on the right is a, an Archimedean spiral also generated by a, a Fibonacci sequence of numbers. And on this particular art project, I, I think this was uh, Lindsay, he did uh, different um, value scales in each of the different squares. Another assignment in the golden ratio unit was to take pictures of golden things or things that adhere to Fibonacci numbers. And so this uh, m many flower petals are supposedly to adhere to a, a Fibonacci number as you spiral out. And uh, the, the guy in the middle, that's Matt, he did a video on uh, he thought it was a conspiracy theory. There was a lot of uh, crank, cranks out there who think the golden ratio is everywhere. So he investigated that. And the, the hand with the ruler on the right is Ruby, where she measured and tested different, different objects and, and human proportions to see if they were uh, to the golden ratio. It's time to make a golden rectangle, everybody. It's time to, get our, to uh, take a piece of origami paper that should be at your desk and I'm going to show you how to, in just about three or four folds, make a golden rectangle. Now, since you're watching this, I'll add, there's a link on my website that I'll, I will provide to show you how to make a golden rectangle. All you need to do is get a square piece of paper, any, any size, as long as it's square. Math and music, uh, here's where I would say, I, in math, I'm used to being an expert. I'm the, the, the person who knows the right answers, and when it comes to math and music, I needed to get over that quickly. Many of my students had AP Music Theory. They're really good. They're, they're artists. They're musicians. They're technology wizards. They're drama and dance aficionados, and they know the Rubik's Cube and chess more than I do. And so this math and music unit, at, at first, I 
just sent out pick, er, questions. And students would take them, research them, and then report on them, which was great. We also read some uh, from a book called Math and Music Harmonious Connections that was, that was interesting. And so, uh, but, but now uh, we also tried making uh, musical instruments, which was not good. This is a picture of Andrew, who was a, an Asperger student of mine. And a after reading a, a chapter in the book on math and music, every student was to make a, a lyrics to a song or make their own song that connects math and music. And so his one was called Running With The Demo for the the Van Halen song, Running With The Devil. I think it just illustrates how this, this class engages all students and that there, it's it's definitely not the typical math class where they're used to. As many of them shine, and, and I, I learn more about them than I ever would have done in an algebra, geometry, or an AP stats class. This semester, I, I've offered math and music at my new school, and so I've teamed with the technology d director, who is also a musician, to learn a digital audio workstation called EarSketch. It's free. It's produced by... Uh, Georgia Tech, and where you can produce your own music. They learn Python, and so kind of in the, mi in the middle there is where there's, there's a, a, a computer language. Though you don't have to know a lot about it, you get uh, used to it a little bit, and up at the top is, the, is kind of the template or the, the, the way where the, the different tracks meet. Down here, I wanted to show you that when we were talking about the, the tracks and the measures, how music is measured in measures, uh, but a movie is measured in seconds, and so a good, a good producer will have to align when things happen in the movie and how the musical score aligns to that. And so the, just some of the complex relationships between the film and sound to make them work is some of the, the, the pieces that we're doing now. I've had, in this semester, I'm having students pair up and we have a, they're to create a film score for a one minute silent film. It's a claymation one called A Friend for Red. Uh, so, but they're learning, they're, they're learning Python, they're learning ear sketch. And uh, though this is not as mathematical, I think it's super rich in the, the, the relationships and the patterns and things that they'll do in real life. Fractals. A fractal is a self-similar pattern, and so many things in, in nature, like clouds, trees, uh, and things inside your body, like the uh, lungs or capillaries, are self-similar. This is a pic an art piece called the, the Coke Snowflake, where you take an equilateral triangle and then iterate it through a series of, of patterns where it, it generates a self-similar uh, image. Some of the student work that we've done before, the one on the left is a, is a kind of a 3D Sierpinski carpet. I call it a fractal card that I learned from, a, from NCTM four years ago in Denver. Um, then the, the other three, the, I had students draw a fractal in real life. So the leaf, the peacock feather, and the heart, which I think the, the heart was excellent because it actually looks like rivers seen from an airplane. So rivers, seashells, like lightning bolts, even galaxies are, are, are somewhat fractal in nature. And so the mathematics behind it is really deep. We've only scratched the surface of this, but I'm still developing resources and collecting resources to, to learn all the math that is involved in it. One thing that, that connects real life is that we started a, a wiki page with students were to take pictures of things that they've seen and then comment on how they think they are fractal-like. So the image on the left is a tree in Hawaii, and then the one on the right is a, uh, a small, small bush that a student took on a walk, walking their dog. This is a drop-in lesson, the Rubik's Cube, that I, I've always wanted to learn how to solve it. And though I don't know exactly, I can't do it from memory, the, the website youcandothecube.com is very helpful for teachers. You can request, I believe, a 12-cube free loan. And so that, 
so that you can have a set of Rubik's Cubes and, and teach students along with the solution guide. I've had uh, competitions, and uh, so the, the three guys on the left, Adam, Colin, and Dylan, are, are working on trying to solve it and trying to do it without the, the use of the, of the solution guide. And then I think this is one of my favorite moments that I, I'm so pleased that I captured it on film. And this is where Colin, who is not used to, to running around in a math class, to celebrating, to having a lot of success, he has done it for the first time. Watch this. It's the first time I've ever done that. Woo! Woo! It warms my heart. And to create an environment where a student is successful like this is just, it, it redeems the fact that this math and art technology history, I think, is something that, that I'm, I'm so glad has taken hold. This was just a, a kind of a drop-in lesson. I think it was either before spring break or, or during a testing week when it was low-key but, but high stress. And so I think we just did it over a couple of days. But I, I tried to create an environment that had people succeed. Tessellations are figures that cover a plane leaving no gaps or overlaps. And so it, this is a picture of another student who has these tessellating fish near their garden. In this unit that I've done before, we've looked into the, the first image on the left is how triangles tessellate, how any convex triangle will tessellate. The second image is where students discover that any convex quadrilateral will tessellate the plane and, and why they do it. Then the third image, I created kind of a little, a little baggie of, of, of regular polygons that involve triangle squares and hexagons. And so I'd had to try to have students discover all the semi-regular tessellations, which is, uh, they're also called the Archimedean tessellations, where they, they have the same, same polygon, same order around each vertex. Um, anybody know how many semi-regular tessellations there are? Did you answer? Well, we'll see. You might just have to look it up. Early on, I've used oop, I've used patty paper and trace and rotate to translate images and glide reflections. We've looked into the MC Escher creations and how he created those. And now I know there exist apps and programs that make it really easy and technological to create them. This is a picture of Romanescu at the market. And it's, I think it's a beautiful fractal. I, I wanted to use my own picture. There are other more beautiful ones and more focused ones that you can get off the internet. But I think uh, just like broccoli and cauliflower, this is self-similar and it is a real life fractal. I think we need to teach, te we, need, we teachers need to share this cool stuff about math in our classes. Math explains the patterns and relationships that we see every day and is all around us. And if we can, can advertise this, that, we, that math is all around us wherever we go, then we can travel far and our kids can appreciate the math all around us and how beautiful it is. I think it's, it's up to us to find this cool stuff and to show them that these patterns and relationships are not just the things that are in our textbook, but they're all around us. And that can be, math can save the world when, when it comes down to it. There are future units that I'd, I'd like to look into. Photography, the, the numbers and card tricks, and either even ethno-mathematics. But I haven't gotten to yet. And so I, I just wanted to share with you some of the resources, just picture-wise, of, of things I've done. And I, I have a, a whole list of the books that I've used and articles and websites that are on my website. These are some of my favorites. The one in the middle, Origami and Math. Uh, simple is not so simple in the complex or ones that uh, we've tried many times but have have failed uh, it's just but it's it's a story of how if you look at something long enough from different perspectives it will start to reveal its secrets to you 
Math and Music, The Harmonious Connections is, is, is excellent, uh, along with this new one that I've discovered from uh, Paul Jackson. He's got a series of books, and he is featured in a new a, a nova called, uh, oh, it's on origami, uh, not the future of origami. Man, I can't remember it. I will put it on the website as well, though. Just uh, resources, too numerous to mention. My email and my website is there. I'd, I'd like to thank you so much for listening and would like to uh, give you a, a parting gift. Since you're watching this, I've created a mathematically correct correct flower to go. It's from a, a video on Vi Heart, by, by Vi Heart, who I su suggest you look into her website, follow her, her Twitter feed. She has she showed me how to create an anglet anglatron that creates a flower that adheres to the golden ratio, which is around 137.5 degrees. Thank you so much for listening, everybody, and please don't hesitate to reach out. I'm always interested in, in trying to, to develop new things, and it's those who are at NCTM who connect with other people outside the classroom that we, we can create some great stuff. Thank you so much. Take care.